one another. Turn those lights all the way up, if you don't mind. Amen. Turn, shake hands with somebody. The little, the little thing on the side. Slide them both up, all of them. Okay. Right. Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. But good to have all of our guests. Amen. Let's give our guests a warm hand of welcome and appreciation. Thank you for being here tonight. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank God for air conditioning. Amen. Brother Jerry and Brother Pate and Brother Lester all uh, cut hay today and put up a bunch of bales of hay. So that's a joke. <laughs> Brother Pate said, I wish I was, wish I could, amen. We're glad to be in the house of the Lord tonight. We want to, uh, we're here to worship the Lord. We're here to lift Him up, amen. He's worthy, amen. These are the times where the saints of God come and we can be strengthened by His Word, encouraged. Somebody say amen. amen. I want us just to enter with prayer tonight. Let's ask the Lord to have His way. Would you just focus your mind now upon Him and your heart, turn it to Him right now, Lord. I thank You, Lord, for Your goodness, Lord, and Your blessings to us as Your people, God, Your children. Lord, we are recipients of Your great mercy and grace, and we give You thanks, Lord, for all that You have done, God. Lord, for the privilege we have to be in church tonight with Your people. Lord, for those, I pray for those that are watching tonight that cannot be here tonight, Lord. Those that are battling sickness, Lord. Those that are battling disease, Lord. In Jesus' name, Lord, I pray your spirit would go in every home. Lord, those that are joining us on the web tonight, we pray, Lord, you would touch them, not only in the worship, God, but the preaching of your word. Lord, let it find its mark tonight in Jesus' name. We give you praise for it. And Lord, we come to worship you and say thank you for all your blessings. Lord, and all of your goodness to us. Lord, we thank you for what you have done, God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, we bless your name tonight, Lord. We want you to have your way tonight, Lord. Lord, we're glad that you saved us and delivered us. I praise you for your blessings to us, Lord. Amen. Let's give the Lord a good hand clap tonight. Amen. We're glad he is here. Amen. 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 Our ushers are going to come and wait upon you for our Wednesday night offering. They'll be right up here. So if you'll just step toward the outside wall and come around. If you don't have something to give, you can march anyway. Get your little exercise. Shake somebody's hand. Greet our guest. Let me make a few announcements uh, this coming Sunday. Remember, we're going to be receiving a, a love offering as a send-off for Brother and Sister Kelly, Kyle, and Amanda. That'll be this Sunday. Amen. So remember that. Also, let me mention that uh, I think it'll be off of the screen, but there was a youth service scheduled for this Friday, but because of uh, uh, some of them quarantining, uh, their, their staff has dwindled, and so they have another one scheduled early in August, so they're going to push that back. So just so you adults are aware of that. Amen. So... Be mindful of that and also be aware of all the announcements that will be on the screen tonight behind me. Amen. Lord, bless this offering. Multiply. Lord, we give from a cheerful heart. For we know, Lord, you have blessed us with all things. And Lord, we thank you for what you're going to do tonight. In Jesus' name. God bless you. Worship with our worship team. Let's give unto the Lord tonight. Amen. Been for 
for Jesus, where would I be? I'm so glad that the Lord saved me. Oh, I'm so glad that the Lord saved me. I'm so glad that the Lord saved me. If it had not been for Jesus, where would I be? I'm so glad that the Lord saved me. He 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 saved me. If it had not been for Jesus, where would I be? I'm so glad that the Lord saved me. He 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 saved me. If it had not been for Jesus, where would I be? I'm so glad that the Lord saved me. Oh, I'm so glad that the Lord saved me. I'm so glad that the Lord saved me. If it had not been for Jesus, where would I be? I'm so glad that the Lord saved me.
Jesus, you change everything. Life healed. Hope is found here now. Jesus, you change everything. Life change for You change everything. Lives healed, hope found here now. Jesus, you change everything. Oh, change, oh, fall. Lord. Lives are changed in your presence, Lord. Amen. Isn't it good to be in the presence of the Lord? Amen. Amen. Lives are changed when we are in the presence of the Lord. Somebody say amen. 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 How many remember the night he changed your life, or at least he started changing it? Amen. I remember a number of years ago, I was going to breakfast with some ministers in our community, and uh, one of them, uh, when I told him I was apostolic Pentecostal, uh, 
they realized there was a heretic at the table. No. <laughs> a cult leader. Anyway, I'm apostolic Pentecostal, and one of them in the process of talking about that, he's, he said, well, let me ask you something then. He said, when were you saved? I said, well, sir, I'm still being saved, if you want to know the truth. And he kind of looked at me like I fell out of a tree. He said, no, I mean, when were you saved? I said, well, I'm still not saved. I won't be saved until I hear him say, well done. Good and faithful servant. Now until then, I'm working it out. <laughs> and see, our danger is we get baptized and we repent, we get baptized, we get full of the Holy Ghost and we, oh, check those boxes. I'm saved. Oh, you're not. You can be lost after you've been baptized. You, you may still be a son, but you can be disinherited. Somebody say amen. Demas forsook after being saved, or at least being filled with the Holy Ghost. So I want to make sure that I recognize my salvation is to come. Amen. I, I, I recognize the things that God has done in my life. But when I got baptized, when I repented and got baptized and got the Holy Ghost, I, I didn't become a full-grown spiritual adult. The Bible indicates that I then was a baby. And I sure don't want to. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, quit being a baby. Quit being a baby. Ask him, how long have you had the Holy Ghost? Quit being a baby. Uh-oh. Nobody's doing it. Nobody's doing it. <laughs> Brother Gene, I don't want to offend this person beside me. I, I understand. Amen. <laughs> It's good to be in church tonight, amen, and uh, amen, I, I'm glad all of you are here, praise God, it'd be, I remember the days when we were recording those services or streaming those services in here and nobody was here, and boy, thank you for being here tonight, praise God, amen. Turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 12, if you have your iPad or your digital device, whatever form your Bible is taken. Amen. And if you don't have your Bible, then evidently uh, Romans 12, you've got memorized, so you don't need to turn to it. Uh, so you just, you just uh, go through it by memory with us. Uh, but if you have your Bibles or your phone, whatever, open your Bible app or your, your uh, trusty sword to Romans 12. Now we're going to go through the first portion of this chapter. Well, fact of the matter is, we're going through the whole chapter. Turn to your neighbor and tell them, thank God it's not uh, Psalms 119. 100, 100 plus verses. Amen. This is just 21. Amen. Praise God. But I do want to focus your attention on a few verses. Now we'll go back and begin at verse 1 and kind of quickly go through to what I want to say to you tonight. But what I really want to focus on is housed in these last five verses, starting with verse 17. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you. Notice he didn't say, if it's possible to be at peace, if the other person straightens up. It says, if it's possible with everything you can do, leave the other person alone. Amen. Yeah. If it's possible as much as is in you, don't get the microscope, get the mirror. Check you. And as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all people. Now the KJV says men, but that don't mean you just should be at peace with men. Women folk are not excluded. I have all my hunting buddies, but me and my wife are at war. It's not what this verse is talking about. Verse 19, dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, 
If thine enemy hunger, tell him to get lost. <laughs> Feed him. If he's thirsty, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Somebody say amen. amen. You recognize the only way to overcome evil is not to add to it or multiply it. If there's one evildoer that approaches me, I hope I don't turn it into two evildoers. And then two folks show up to break it up and now we've got four evildoers. I'm just multiplying evil. The only way to overcome evil is with good. Somebody say amen. So I want to speak tonight on a subject I've entitled The Crown of Kindness. The Crown of Kindness. Amen. Lord, thank you for your word. I pray you help us to be more like you when we leave tonight. Help us to have the spirit and the mind and the attitude of Christ. Help us, Lord, to be more, uh, have your attitude in our hearts, in our minds. Lord, I pray, God, that we would be your sons and daughters, and we are because we're bought by your blood, but I pray, Lord, we would obey you, and we begin to operate in the, in the way that you've called us, Lord, in this passage. I pray you touch us tonight in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. God bless you. You can be seated. Amen. Somebody say praise God for a good seat. Hey, y'all sit down. I'll go ahead and stand up here the rest of the service. Boy, we sure stand a lot. Yep, nobody more than I. All right, so just so get comfortable. Get comfortable. Everybody comfy? All right, God bless you. I need to do a pull a McKellar and have a lazy boy on Wednesday night and kick the legs back. I'm teasing. Amen. The crown of kindness. Everybody say that. The crown of kindness. When we, uh, we are moved by the mercies of God. How many is thankful for the mercy of God? Amen. And when our minds have been renewed and we know that he has a will for us that we would have abundant life. Amen. Not, not worry and fear and anxiety. And we've been touched by his mercy and we grasp that his will for our lives is to be blessed and to be uh, prosperous, uh, to prosper even as our soul prospers. Uh, somebody say amen. amen. And, and when we come to the mercy of God and we start obeying his will, we realize that it transforms every relationship around us, or it should. It should. I believe your neighbor getting saved ought to show up in the neighborhood. I believe you being saved <laughs> ought to show up in the neighborhood. I believe your neighbors ought to say, you know, that's the best neighbor. <laughs> Somebody say amen. amen. So every relationship ought to be changed. Now this is a challenge, I understand. We're gonna talk about relationships tonight. We're gonna talk about what the will of God is for us in in our relationship with God and in our relationship with each other in this room and then in our relationships with, with others, specifically our enemies. Our enemies. Now, I'm not talking about the Senate <laughs> or who's in office or Governor Pritzker. I'm talking about even some of your family members. I'm talking about people that you may have issues with. Everybody okay? All right. So it's like the, them asking the Lord said, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, our first response is, well, tell me who that is. Who is my neighbor? And so we say, uh, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If your enemy's thirsty, give him to drink. We go, well, who's my enemy? I don't have any enemies. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. We'll, we'll define that. Uh, in, in verses one and two, we find where we are to offer our bodies to God. Amen. In Romans chapter 12, verses one and two, beseech you therefore, brother. We'll talk about this in a little greater detail. Then he says we are, verses three through eight, he talks about our self-image, how we ought to view ourselves, how we ought to be sober 
In other words, look honestly at ourselves. And then verses 9 through 16, he goes into uh, loving one another. You know, presenting yourself to God is very important. And then having a good view of who you are and who God sees you as uh, opens the door for us. Now, what's amazing is he does not say present your body to God, honor God with your life, and then love one another, and then develop a good self-image. No, a good self-image comes before, even in this passage. <laughs> the Lord said, love your neighbor as yourself. You can't love somebody else until you have a good image of who you are. Somebody say amen. And in this passage, it's no different. Uh, verses three through it, through eight talk about how we ought to think about ourselves, how we ought to perceive ourselves. And then he goes into loving one another, the community of believers, how we ought to treat each other. And then huh, the last five verses, it'd be great if he closed up in verse 16 and we, we love God and we love ourselves and we love everybody to go to church with. But then he finishes it out with our enemies. Um, these have already been mentioned. They have already appeared in Romans. Look at verse 14. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Somebody say amen. amen. These are persecutors. Everybody say persecutors. The enemies in Romans 12 first appear as persecutors. But look at verse 17, recompense to no man evil for evil. They go from a persecutor to an evildoer. <laughs> Even people that are perpetuating evil. Everybody okay? In fact, the last five verses of Romans 12 handle the question of how we should respond to evildoers. Good and evil are contrasted throughout the entire chapter, verses 9, verses 17, verse 21, even in chapter 13 and verse 3 and 4. Uh, the most striking, listen, the most striking thing about this final paragraph starting in verse 17, if we add verse 14, which anticipated the rest of it, it is, it contains four negative uh, imperatives or commands, four Verse 14 says, do not curse. Turn to your neighbor and tell them, quit cussing. <laughs> tell them, I mean it. Pastor said it, quit cussing. Do not curse. Do not. Verse 17, do not repay anybody, anybody, evil for evil. That's, <laughs> do we need to explain that? That means, well, they did that, so I'm gonna do this. I'm talking to you. I don't care how righteous it looks. Well, they did this, I'm gonna do that. That's what it's talking about. Okay, so now you know who your enemy is. It's all the people you say, well, they did this, so I'm gonna do that. Don't repay anyone evil for evil. Anyone, say anyone. anyone. That doesn't mean only a certain race. That doesn't mean only Democrats or Republicans or independents or knuckleheads or saved or lost. It says anyone. Well, they're incarcerated. Anyone. Okay, I don't need to bring up the Greek translation for that. Uh, the, the third negative, do not take revenge. Revenge. And then, verse 21, do not be overcome by evil. Don't let evil change your righteous walk. Don't let evil change these things. Somebody say amen. And all these four negatives say the same thing in different words. And it's this. Retaliation or revenge is absolutely forbidden for followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Absolutely forbidden. In fact, if we're talking about Jesus, he never hit back by words or by actions, ever. That's making you nervous, isn't it? 
No? Okay, good. Surely you're aware of our inborn retributive tendencies. We see it at school. We have a, we have a little, in, uh, uh, a little uh, situation on the playground and let, let's, let's try to pull up some, let's don't even pull up any names. Let's just leave, because you'll wonder who I'm talking about. Let's, little, little boy A and little boy B, and the teacher comes out and they're pulling hair and punching and wallowing around on the ground and the teacher runs out and pulls them apart. You can probably finish it. The teacher goes, what are y'all doing? Why are y'all treating each other like this? Why are y'all fighting? And invariably, one of them's gonna say, what? He started, he started it. <laughs> you know, that's human nature. He started it. What's gonna happen after that? I'm going to finish it. That vocabulary is stricken from a child of God. Stricken. You know as well as I do, yeah, children are a little more out front. They're just, well, he pulled my, he, he, he punched me in the back, I punched him in the nose. But adults are a little more sophisticated about their retaliation. I'd much rather deal with the little boys out there going to fisticuffs because there are people in this room that know how to go to fisticuffs without ever throwing a punch. Amen. You know how to treat somebody a certain way to make them pay. Boy, I don't know if the Lord dropped that in there or if it's my flesh. But I want to tell you, husbands and wives, there is no place for retaliation. I've said it before. If you use sex as a tool... Boy, it's getting quiet now. You nervous now? Pastor said the three-letter word. <laughs> well, bless God, if he, since he did that, he went and bought that, he's sleeping on the couch for two weeks. I think we ought to have Sister Sherry come to the music right now. <laughs> And, and play bind us together. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, <laughs> adults are a little more sophisticated in their get backs and their retaliations. Well, I just won't speak to them. I'll, I just, I'll just go the other way when they're coming down the, the, the aisle at Walmart. Well, it's getting, getting tight now, isn't it? I just want, I'll just unfriend them. That'll show them. I'm talking to you. I am talking to you. Retaliation and revenge are absolutely forbidden. You say what you want about everybody back there in CR tonight. But if you're sitting in here and you're into revenge and retaliation and making people pay, there's no difference to sin. None. None. Okay, Jesus calls us to imitate him. You know, that old, please don't let it just be on a bracelet. What would Jesus do, WWJD? What would Jesus do? In the place, uh, the place for the punishment of evildoers, in fact, you say in your mind, well, wait a minute, what about evildoers? What about this, what about that? Paul deals with that uh, going on into chapter 13, and he says, the court of justice and law handles that. Don't take justice into your own hands. Somebody say amen. Help me now. I'm going to try to hurry. Our personal conduct, we should never uh, conduct ourselves to get our own, to get back by injuring those who have injured us. This is the, the imperative. In fact, Paul's four negative commands are imperatives are accompanied by positive things. In fact, when he says, do not curse, he says, but bless. When he says, do not retaliate, 
He adds, but do what is right and live at peace. <laughs> Somebody say amen. amen. He says, in fact, when he says do not take revenge, he says the positive, leave this to God. <laughs> leave that to God. <laughs> you serve your enemy. And then he says we should not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now I'm going to... I'm going to hurry through these few verses and get to the very last paragraph. Verses 1 and 2 in Romans 12. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world. Listen, what the world does in their relationships has nothing to do with what we're supposed to do. See, there, there's a mental disconnect when the preacher starts talking about retaliation and retribution and revenge and justice and all that. We start thinking the way the world operates. But the Lord says, don't be conformed to this world system, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. To grasp what I'm going to show you tonight, you've got to have a renewed mind. You've got to have a spiritual mind. Somebody say a spiritual mind. That, there's a transformation that comes when we have a renewed mind and we make up our minds not to conform to this world system. Now in verses 3 through 8, he talks about presenting ourselves to one another. He talks about us having a healthy self-image. Somebody say amen. And here's where it starts. Verse 3. And for I say, though the, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, Look what he says. Don't think more highly of yourself than you ought. I'm not sure how you ought to think about yourself, but the, 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 the prohibition is we're much more uh, susceptible to thinking more of ourselves than we are to thinking less of ourselves. In fact, some people flip it where they act like they're thinking less of themselves when really they're wanting you to prop up their self-image. Oh, I'm terrible. I'm, I don't know. I'm, I'm this. I'm, I'm, I'm no good. I'm, I'm not. Put me on at the doormat. I'll be the doormat out in front of the parking lot. And, and, oh, no. Come on. Yeah, you're awesome. Come on. You understand what I'm saying? A healthy self-image. Self not being more proud and arrogant, but not being down in the dirt either. <laughs> Somewhere in there where a man realizes I'm a child of God. He loves me. He, he thought enough of me to save me, to let me hear the gospel. I'm not chopped liver. I'm not sure what chopped liver, well, that's just hot dogs, sorry. <laughs> Do not think more highly of yourselves. Think of yourself soberly. Why? Because we are one body, many members. We've got lots of gifts. Your gift is not the most important. Your gift is not the only one we need. Praise God. Somebody say amen. amen. And then verse 9, he talks about love. Everybody say love. love. The sincerity of it and how that uh, this all cooperates when we love each other. He, goes, he says it. Let love be without dissimulation. Dissimulation. That, that means pretending. Pretending. Be real. Be real. Somebody say amen. And he goes on to talk about this issue of love in verse 9. He says, abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good, be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another, Put, putting others in front of me. Somebody say amen. amen. How is this possible? We keep reading. Not slothful in business. Look, look at this. He's talking to the church about business. Do I need to explain this? That you would never treat your boss that doesn't know the Lord this way. But when you go into a business transaction with a saint... You think, well, we understand each other. It doesn't matter if I don't pay them back. It doesn't matter if I tear their stuff up. <laughs> Uh-oh. He 
he says, don't be slothful, talking to the church, don't be slothful in your business with each other. You ever heard somebody say, that's the last time I'll do business with another church person? You know why? Because we've been slothful in business. Somebody took advantage of somebody. And that's not love. I feel really bad when people say, Pastor, I'm going to do this for you. And I say, no, I'm going to pay you for it. And they go, no, you're not. And I say, yes, I am. <laughs> they go, no, you're not. And I say, yes, I am. The labor's worthy of his hire. <laughs> Unless they're not a tithe payer. And I'll say, you know what? That's right, you're doing it for free. That's right. And you're going to do it again next week? <laughs> no, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. That's a joke. That's not in love. Somebody say amen. It's possible. And then in verse, he says, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit. Everybody say fervent. Yeah, that's, that means heated. That means on fire. I'd love to have a church like that, full, full of people fervent in spirit. It's all right to holler out and say, praise the Lord, and act like you're on fire a little bit. I bet if you caught on fire, you'd roll on the floor. <laughs> Stop, drop, and roll. So act like you're on fire. <laughs> so, my sister, bless her heart, we had a little space heater. I don't know why we even had a heater in Louisiana. <laughs> I mean, I've been down there, you know, I moved up here all those many years ago and kind of got acclimated and started going back for the holidays. They go, ooh, it's, it's a cold Christmas. Oh, isn't it great to be cold at Christmas? And I'm like, man, this is golf weather. It's 50 degrees and they're all bundled up. And I got to thinking back, and we had a big fireplace in the house and I remember, I mean, it was, you know, October, um, October, late October, early November, we'd start having fire, split wood, we'd have fire, and I thought, you know, it had to be in the mid-40s in the morning and, and 65 by the afternoon, but bless God, we're gonna have a fire in the fireplace. Well, my sister, you know, we had, the first one was a little gas imitation log, my sister, we were getting ready for church, she'd put on some, some of her clothes, but still had her little sleeping gown, little gown over, and she was backing up to the, to the this little gas fake fireplace and uh, all of a sudden she looked behind her and there were flames coming up behind her. It caught her little gown on fire, melted her gown to her leotards and she her hair was down to her waist so her hair was all down in the back of her and she just saw these flames. Well, she didn't know what to do. She just took off running. Well, that's not what you do. But I think that's probably what Lester experiences when on Sunday morning he just can't take it anymore, just jumps out in the middle. I don't care if he's 70 plus. It feels like I'm on fire. <laughs> that's fervent in spirit. I'm starting to feel a little fervency. Uh, look, not slow from business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, patient Oh, we could all work there a little bit. Continuing instant in prayer, always be in prayer. Distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. Hospitality. He's talking about love. Everybody say love. love. And then in verse 14, he talks about how this love now broadens. It now goes beyond the church walls. It's one thing for us to come in and be hospital. Well, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. <laughs> We do have those among us that when you say, well, not among us, but part of the church, not just this church, but it's like my Granny Price. She comes down the church aisle, how are you doing? And the lady starts telling her. <laughs> and I start feeling old, not because uh, my, how many birthday candles I have on my cake. I'm, I'm now feeling old because I'm starting to get the urge to tell people private information. We go to the young at heart meetings instead of just saying, man, it's been great. Cardinals are doing great. And, and man, it's great to play uh, being bad toss. And boy, isn't it awesome. Kids, good to have no kids at home. I, all that is out the door. I start thinking about 
how my feet are hurting and, and how bad, how long it took my back to get over the backache and, and we start talking about that and, and then somebody one-ups me and they say, well, you think that's bad. I... <laughs> then we all trim each other's toenails and go home. <laughs> It's not that I'm that I've got a bunch of birthday candles. It's just I'm starting to feel like I need to tell people stuff I probably shouldn't tell them. <laughs> that I'm going in for a procedure. That, and, and you know, it's very important that we treat one another with hospitality. That we be friendly. I don't. I don't know of anybody. Well. Most, yeah, everybody. We, 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 just, we should be hospitable and friendly with one another. But that's not what Paul is, is really saying what should be a given. This should be a given. You should treat each other this way. Here's how you should operate. But then he goes into what happens outside of these walls. Verse 14. He says, bless them that persecute you. Don't curse them. Rejoice with them that rejoice. Weep with them that weep. Wait a minute. Wait. A minute. How many know that verse? Rejoice with those that rejoice. How many have quoted that before? You know, you understand the context. That's not another saint. That's not me weeping because Sandy is weeping because she got a bad report from her doctor. This is just after the change between how I treat you folks I go to church with. Now he's talking about how I treat the persecutor. He says rejoice with the persecutor. Weep with the one who's not treating you right if they're weeping. Re uh oh. I don't know how you feel about people that trouble you, but most times when they're having it bad, we're laughing. <laughs> uh, yeah, they got a flat tire. Hey, good to see you. Hope you enjoy that. <laughs> He's talking about those that persecute you. Weep with the person who has hurt you. If they're weeping, you weep. Don't gloat. Don't say, oh, I've been waiting for this day. Oh, well, I got to keep going. I'm trying. Rejoice with them that rejoice. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceit. Look at all this. If your enemy is rejoicing, rejoice. If your enemy is weeping, weeping. This is an issue of attitude. It, it really is. It, 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 it starts erasing the attitude in my Christian heart that says they deserve that. I start realizing, now wait a minute. This is somebody the Lord loves. This is somebody he loves just as much as he loves me. I don't understand it. I don't know how he could, but he does. He feels the same way about them. Why can't I? Why can't I feel the same way about them as I do about me? Isn't this the heart of the golden rule? Do unto others before they do unto you, right? <laughs> no. Do unto others as you would have done to you. Somebody say amen. Amen. Be of the same mind. Everybody say the same mind. And then he says, be not wise in your own conceits. Well, I'm not conceited. Well, that's not what that word means. <laughs> it means estimation. It means how you estimate yourself. I'm pretty smart. I think I'm smarter than them. I think I'm skinnier than them. I think I got a better tan than them. I think I got a better car than them and a better house than them. And we got a better job than them. And we got more toys than them. Understand what I'm saying? 
Be not wise in your own estimation. Get them off your high horse there. If you got more toys, it's only because the Lord's blessed you and He wants you to use your toys for something beside yourself. Somebody say amen. All right, then we get to verse 17. And this recompense no man, evil for evil. Provide things. That are, what does this kind of love in a renewed mind look like? It looks like not repaying evil for evil. Being honest, living peaceably. Living at peace. Nobody needs this more than a bunch of church people. Live at peace. You know, the good thing about being at peace with your neighbors is you can just leave them alone. <laughs> stay on your side of the fence, I'll stay on my side of the fence. But we can't do that in here. We're going to come to church this week and we're going to come to church Sunday. We're going to bump into each other. We're going to see each other. <laughs> Somebody say amen. amen. And he starts talking about this evil for evil and, and live it, it, with everything in you. Be at peace. Don't be a war, a person that likes to go to war. Somebody say amen. amen. All right. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. This is God's arena. Why does the Lord say through the Apostle Paul, don't look for revenge? Because this is God's property. Now I could give you three weeks on stealing from God the first fruits and why that's a bad idea. Yeah, okay. I can also tell you that anytime we assume ownership of something that God says is His, that's a bad deal. If something's God's, it's God's. And it'll never be mine, it'll never be yours. And so He says, Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. <laughs> you know why God is the one that avenges? Because God is the only one that is just. No. We're not just. We may try our best, but I want to tell you now, you will treat your kids different than you will my kids. It's very difficult for our humanity to be completely just not preferring anyone. Come on now. Well, that's my kid. What, what would you do with any other kid? Everybody all right? God is the only one that can be completely just. Number one. Second thing, God is the only one that knows everything. And while you're getting ready to pass judgment on this person that has hurt you, you have no idea why they even want to hurt somebody. No, you're not hearing me, but I'm gonna keep on. The Lord knows what difficulties they've had. The Lord knows what they've been through. The Lord knows what psychological trauma they've experienced. And you don't know any of that. None of it. And you're gonna render your judgment. And you're going to get vengeful because you know all the facts. But you don't. Only, this is why God says, don't you do that. You're not smart enough. I'm not smart enough to do that. To render a judgment that says, this person deserves A, B, C. You have no idea what they deserve. You haven't walked one minute in their boots. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. He's the only one smart enough to judge it. I love it in the book of Revelation. I gotta, I gotta hurry. Yeah, it's almost eight. I got four minutes. 
We're not going to make it. <laughs> Says live honestly. <laughs> Look, I love it in Revelation. It's like the angel talking to John. It's always asking John questions. John, who are these, this number that can't be numbered? <laughs> I like John. John's not like some of us. We'd be saying, oh, I know who that is. <laughs> yeah, glad you asked. <laughs> no, John just keeps on saying, I don't know, you know. <laughs> and the angel says, what about this, John? And John goes, I don't know, only you know. I wonder if at times when we're ready to pat, to, to strike the gavel and pass the judgment and avenge ourselves of some hurt, I wonder if we would stop for a minute and say, Lord, now I don't know everything there is to know. And I know there's things I don't understand. So Lord, this is yours. You know, Lord, I don't. But you know, that's, that's pleading ignorance. And none of us want to be ignorant. Ignorant. Avenge not yourselves. We allow the wrath of God to follow its own course. Look, God has not asked the believers to help God carry out divine retribution. I want to burst you a little bubble. God is not going to call all the born again believers to take up arms and go kill all the infidels. God doesn't need our help avenging his blood on the cross. No, in fact, when he does finally avenge it, he alone is going to fight the battle and all we're going to be is spectators. You're aware of that, right? We're going to be on white horses. He's going to have to help me with that. And we're not going to do anything, not a thing. Turn to your neighbor, not a thing. Not a thing. The Bible says a sword's coming out of his mouth. He's going to avenge for himself. He doesn't need our help. Turn your neighbor and tell him he doesn't need my help. Turn your neighbor and tell him God doesn't need my advice. Well, Lord, if I was you, I'd do this. Yeah, and you better be glad you're not God because of the way he treated you. Genuine trust leaves everything in the hands of God. Lord, this is yours. Vengeance, judgment, retribution, it's all yours. I'm not touching it. This verse deals with the thought that an enemy may be incorrigible. In other words, they're not going to turn around. They're not going to get any better. And the own, there's only one thing remaining, and that is that we are to love them. 1 Corinthians 13 says love hopeth all things all the way to the very end and despite, in spite of our impatience God's wrath is restrained I don't know why God is taking his time yes this world's waxing worse and worse yes it's getting darker and darker I know judgment is coming but I'm leaving that in the hands of God I am called to love Somebody say amen. amen. So what are we to do in the waiting? I, I want to share something with you, and I'm closing. So share, you can't come. What do we do in the waiting? <laughs> we are not merely to endure and say, well, I can't, I'm not going to touch it. God's going to judge it. And, and when we get hurt, we just say, well, it's just, you know, that's that. And, and I'm, I can't re retaliate. And the Lord doesn't want me to retaliate. And, and What do we do? No, the Bible says we should take a proactive stance. In other words, the word persecute really means someone that hurts you. Now the Lord didn't say just back off and let me handle it. He said here there's some things you need to do. And what you need to do is, listen, listen, is to seek to see your persecutor, the one that hurts you, to see their heart change. If possible, as much as in you is, 
What we want to see is not just, well, he stays on his side of the fence, I stay on my side. What would be great is if there's repentance. <laughs> Things made right. The, the hatchet buried. Somebody say amen. How do we do this? How do we do it? Well, Paul gets a verse out of Proverbs chapter 25. I'm going to look at it in just a minute. He grabs a verse out of Proverbs 25 and drags it all the way here to the book of Romans. And in verse 20, verse 20, Therefore, if thine enemies hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him to drink. If in doing so, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Somebody say amen. Rather than revenge, if an enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him to drink. In other words, don't let your faith in God and you're a believer, don't let it alienate you from people that have done you wrong. No, no, you didn't hear me. Just because you're a believer does not mean you should say, I've got to alienate myself from people that have hurt me. Paul says to the church at Rome, he says, yes, they have persecuted. Yes, they have perpetrated evil on you. But feed them and give them to drink. Because when you do this, you heap coals of fire on their head. Oh, yeah, and there's nothing better than to see my enemy's head on fire. This is the way we think of that verse. I'm going to heat coals of fire on them. It's going to burn their brain out. I'm going to kill them with kindness. Well, wait a minute. Isn't killing murder? How do you... How in one hand am I supposed to feed and love my enemies while secretly I'm glad that they're burning up? Oh, I'm heaping coals of fire. Everybody good? Let's compare these two verses. When you feed your enemy, when you give that one that hurts you something to drink, you heap coals of fire on there. Look at Romans 12, 20. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirsts, give him to drink. For in doing so, thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head. This direct quote from Proverbs 25. Look at it. I think it's up there. If thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. If he be thirsty, give him water to drink. For thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head. Look, and the Lord shall reward thee. Do you notice any difference in these two verses? You notice it immediately. In Romans, there is no reward. In Proverbs, he says, if you give your enemy something to drink, something to eat, you'll heap coals of fire on his head and the Lord will reward you. But Paul leaves out the reward. In other words, the divine reward mentioned in Proverbs 25, there should, there's a new motivation now. You don't need a reward for doing what's right. It's because you love. Yeah. You don't need the Lord to give you a better job because you fed somebody that hurt you. No, you have the Lord in you and you love like he wants you to love. So the motivation is not a reward. It's his love. <laughs> Anybody hear what I'm saying? Yeah, and you know why it's his love? Because you know. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, I know. You don't even know what I'm about to say, but you know. You know how you did not deserve his love. You know how you did not deserve his forgiveness. You know better than anybody else how judgment could have been rendered in your life, but God was merciful to you. And because of what you know, it's easy for you to feed your enemy and give those to drink who have hurt you. Yeah, no, they don't deserve it. But you know what? You didn't deserve it either. You didn't deserve it either. God's love is for the undeserving. Somebody say amen. I wish all I had to do was take somebody out to eat to turn them into my friend. But there's no guarantee that giving somebody food is going to convert them from my enemy to being my friend. 
but I'm commanded to show an act of kindness and love to even those who hurt me. Well, Brother Gene, you don't know what they did. I called them and gave them a piece of my mind. I wrote them an email and I told them off. Wait a minute. Lord, help us tonight. It involves being motivated by love. Somebody say love. It, it, it's, Paul is saying if you will have compassion and love your enemy, the one that hurt you, the one that's persecuted you, the one that's perpetrated evil, if you will bless them and have compassion, he says you will heap coals of fire. That's an Old Testament expression from the idea of punishment. And if we're not careful, we think that way. Oh, I'm going to love them, but it's going to hurt them real bad. Yeah, I love them, but it's going to make them squirm. I'm going to take them a cake and I'm going to watch them squirm in the doorway. That's not what he's talking about. The figure is constantly burning pain. Think about coals of fire on your head. Have you thought about it? <laughs> That's not comfortable. Somebody say amen. amen. It's, it, in some translation, it means burning pains of shame. It's like your adversary is now shameful of his actions. But, but that you do realize there's real sophisticated forms of revenge, don't you? Real sophisticated forms of revenge. The, the thought then would be doing your enemy kindness to increase his guilt. I'm going to do real good stuff to him so he feels really bad about the way he's treating me. That's not what that verse is talking about. No. No. In fact, this doesn't even match the context of what Paul is saying. How can he say to us for 16 verses, love God, love yourself, love each other, and love your enemy. And then, oh, by the way, when you bake them a cake, you're only doing it to make them feel really bad. No, it doesn't fit, does it? No. Absolutely does not fit. He has in multiplied verses told us about love and not being vengeful, having the right spirit, having the same mind. So these coals of fire are not God's wrath and they are not my revenge. No, that's not what it is. The context in Romans 12 is dominated by love. The entire chapter is about love. It is what God's love looks like in everyday life. Then why would Paul say to us, be really nice to somebody who has injured you, injured you, because then they will feel really horrible about what has happened? That's not what he's saying. No. Paul has been talking about genuine love. Paul is referring to a common meal that the Roman believers had. They had these fellowship meals. They called them love feast. And he tells these Roman believers, look, even people who have injured you, been hostile to you, and persecuted you, invite them to your meal. Take them out to eat. Is this how we feel about somebody who has injured us? No. Usually we try to stay a country mile at least away from them. I'm asking you to examine your heart tonight. For those coals of fire are a symbol of repentance and penitence. In fact, commentators draw attention to an, uh, an Egyptian ritual in which uh, way back in ancient times, someone who was very uh, sorry or repentant for a certain action, they would literally carry around a bowl of burning coals on their head as evidence that they have changed their mind, that they realized their error. <laughs> Are you hearing me? 
that they realize they made a mistake and they want to visibly show that they are changing their mind about what is taking place. This is what Paul is referring to. He uses it as a symbol that when we do kind things for people who do not deserve it, when we, we need to pray right now. Lord, in the name of Jesus. Lord, I feel that wall I'm hitting right now. And I pray in the name of Jesus that your word would pierce through the darkness right now. In the, na in the name of Jesus. Lord, I bind every worldly spirit that tries to make us vengeful, that tries to make us score counters, that tries, oh Lord, to turn us into folks that seek retribution. I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you help us to obey your word. And Lord, as we love and as we have compassion and as we do good to even those who have treated us badly, we are gonna believe that you are going to work on them that they're going to repent that they're going to have a change of heart that they're going to see the error of their way because we love them to it what, what is Paul saying Paul is saying treat, listen treat your enemy in such a way that it will lead to their repentance Wait, I don't know if this is even a reality. But God forbid somebody be in the auditorium this coming Sunday and not go to the altar because of somebody's attitude down at the end of the pew. Treat one another in such a way that will lead people to want to repent. I, I gotta find God. These people love me. They've been good to me in spite of my mess ups and my failures. And here I am, I'm going to the altar. I need the Lord. That's what the coals of fire are. It's not you sitting in the corner watching them burn. No, it's your actions are leading them to a point where they can't get it out of their mind. I got to get this straight. And you know what? You not speaking to them is not going to do that. Oh, Lord. But you loving them. And I know it's, it's totally contrary to the way you was raised. But be not conformed to this world. I know. I know it's crazy. But try it. Try it. See if the coals of fire won't do their work. If you'll obey God, Lord, I'm going to love. I'm not just going to love in the abstract. Notice, notice he didn't say just, just love them. No, he said put your love in action. Feed them. Give them something to drink. Oh, I love them, but I can't stand them. I love them, but I ain't, I don't, I don't, no, that's not good enough. The only way the coals of fire, the only way your results lead them to repentance is if your love is not just in the abstract, it's in reality. What would you do with heaps of live coals on your head? I took a picture, I got a picture of them up here. It looks like a good barbecue, doesn't it? Looks like a good brisket going here. You know, if you had a, I've been messing with the fire, stirring the fire and pushing the logs around. All of a sudden, one of those coals pop out and fall on my pants. You know what I do? I just sit there and think, you know what? Let's burn the house down. I've had them pop out on the hardwood floor. And I just sit there, well, let's see how long it takes for it to catch. No, as soon as one of them things gets loose, you know what I do? I stomp on it, I brush it off. Oh, get it out of my hair. <laughs> what if you had live coals in your hair? You'd immediately... Get them out. Kindness. Kindness is like live coals in somebody's hair. They got to do something with it. They can't just leave it alone.
You know what? If they see you at the end of the aisle Walmart and you back up and go the other way, they don't have to do nothing with that. They can ignore it. They can go, oh, well, so what? Didn't hurt me. But kindness puts a live coal in their hair. They can't ignore that. Something's got to give. So kindness is just as effective in breaking a hard heart as live coals are at setting your hair on fire. In other words, kindness is just as effective as a live coal. So that means these coals are more like a crown. A crown. A crown of kindness. That I'm loving them, that I'm giving to them, that I'm showing my compassion, and that is going to burn into their hearts and minds and lead them to repentance. Lord, help us to be kindly affectioned one to another. In Jesus' name. I want you to stand right now. I want you to connect with somebody. And I want you to pray, Lord, give us greater compassion, greater love. I thank God for this church. This is a loving church. I, 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 I recognize that. It, this, this is just preventive medicine. This is like taking your vitamin D, okay? This is just like taking a good dose of vitamin D. It's preventive. It, Lord, help us to have the right attitude. Brother Gene, are you saying I don't love anybody? No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying evaluate. The only way you know if you really have the love of Christ is not how you love those that love you and not love those that hadn't done you wrong. No, how do you treat those who have hurt you? How do you treat those who have persecuted you? How have you treated those who have wronged you? Now the love of Christ is tested. So let's pray. Lord, touch us right now. In the name of Jesus, Lord, I'm praying that our love would shine forth, not only in this church, but in this community, oh God. Oh Lord, we're not talking about taking away the truth. We're not talking about absolving the truth. We're not talking about ignoring wrongs, but we are talking about our responsibility. And our responsibility as a blood-bought, forgiven, justified believer is to love those, to bless those, to feed and, and give those to drink that have persecuted, who have hurt, who haven't treated me right. I'm just going to keep on loving. I'm just going to keep on blessing. I'm just going to keep on showing the love of Christ. And Lord, I pray you would start it in our minds right now. Oh Lord, it's not even an emotion that we need to feel. We need the mind of Christ right now. Lord, I pray for the mind of Christ to settle upon us, God. In the name of Jesus, help us to put a crown of kindness on our community, to put a crown of kindness on our neighbors, to put a crown of kindness on those we go to church with, to put a crown of kindness on those who haven't always done the right thing. Oh Lord, vengeance is yours. You're gonna settle the score. So Lord, I'm giving that to you. But Lord, I'm gonna do what you've called me to do. You've called me, Lord, to have loving kindness even to my enemies. Lord, help us now. Help us now. Lord, the enemies of the church are multiplying. Help us now. Help us now. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus. Creating us a clean heart. Renewing us a right spirit, oh Lord. Come on, lift your hands now, Lord. Fill me with kindness. Fill me with your love. Oh Lord, I, I'm not heaping coals of retribution on somebody. No, this, this kindness, oh Lord, will lead them to repentance. It'll burn into their hearts, oh God. Oh, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Jesus' name. You know what? I've been, I've been out to eat with a good group of godly, Holy Ghost-filled people. And I've been completely embarrassed at the way they treated the waitress. Of all people, we should be kind to. One of my family members was working their way through Bible college and they were a busboy at a popular eating uh, eatery. Eatery. Mexican place. <laughs> he had to work one Sunday. He asked him to give him every Sunday off. He just happened to have to go into work on this particular Sunday and he's back there getting ready to bust tables and the restaurant opens in about 30 minutes in. You know, opens at 11. You start getting close to noon. You know who's going to show up. The church people. He's back in the back getting ready to bust tables and some of the waitresses are, are coming in saying, oh no, guess who's here? And the other waitresses said, oh, who's here? And they go, the bunheads. The bunheads are here. My family member said, who's the bunheads? And they said, oh, those people that treat you horrible and want you to do everything for them and don't leave a tip. A family member said, well, I don't know if I know these people. So he went out from the kitchen and opened the doors and looked around. There's a bunch of apostolics. He went back into the kitchen and said, hey, I am a bunhead. They said, no, you're not a bunhead. He said, no, I am a bunhead. God forbid I want to tell you, when people, in this community, when we leave the restaurant, they ought to think, I hope those people come back. Amen. Your neighbors, when the U-Haul is pulling out of your driveway, your neighbors ought to be crying in the street. I'm serious. I am serious. Kindness is a crown that leads people to repentance. Try it on your spouse. Try it on your kids. Try it on your in-laws. Betty, be kind to Mike. Somebody say amen. I'm looking for it. I think I've found it. Yeah, Jesus uh, spoke of, uh, this is a prediction of Jesus on the cross. It's Psalms 22. Be, be not far from me, for trouble is near me, for there is none to help. Many bulls have compassed me, strong bulls of Bashan have beset me around about. They gaped upon me with their mouths. As a ravening, a ravening and a roaring lion, I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue cleaves to my jaws and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them. They cast lots upon my vesture. But be not thou far from me O Lord O my strength haste thee to help me do you know who that is that is Jesus on the cross and nobody's ever hurt you that much oh no you've been hurt there's been a lot of bulls and dogs and ravenous lions circle you and take a piece out of you but I want to tell you he opened not his mouth <laughs> And I want to say, the enemies of the church are gathering. Society's not getting any kinder to believers. It's not time to quit loving. Not time to quit showing kindness. In fact, it's time to love even more. <laughs> Would anybody agree that there's some bad, dark, evil going on in our world right now? You know what the answer is? Paul said it, overcome evil with good. 
let's leave here and let's do good to everybody. Not just our family. Not just our spouse. Everybody. Somebody say amen. amen. Lord, thank you for this night. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your kindness to us. In fact, it is the goodness of God that led us to repentance. And Lord, I'm praying right now that it's the goodness of your people that heap a crown of coals of fire upon the people that have even persecuted them and hurt them. Lord, help us to leave and be kind. In Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. amen. We're going to pray tonight, Brother, Brother Nick Borders. Uh, his dad had a stroke this past week, uh, this past Saturday. He's in very serious condition. They also, because they were exam he's in St. Louis, they were examining his, the effects of the stroke. They found a mass in his lungs. And so the doctor, they're trying to figure out if they want to go in and get this, or at least do a biopsy. He's, he's paralyzed on his, completely on his left side, and he really needs a miracle. So let's pray. His name is Butch Border. It's Brother Nick's dad. Also, Pat Fowler is having a heart cath next week. Let's pray uh, that that will uh, go good and, and uh, that, that the Lord would keep them. Pray for Pat. Phyllis Maskey, uh, a brain tumor. And Don Gates uh, has a brain tumor also. Uh, these are some that were turned in. I know there'll be some on the screen behind me. Amen. Let's pray for this. Anybody here tonight need prayer? You're sick in your body. Amen. You're sick. Right now, nobody wants to claim to be sick, do they? <laughs> Amen. Come on. Come on, Brother Paul. Brother Paul needs prayer. Uh, our ministers come. Let's pray for Brother Paul. And while we do, let's pray for these needs tonight. In Jesus' name. Lord, I believe you. I thank you, Lord, for, for your healing power. I pray you touch Nick's dad. Lord, I pray you would touch Butch right now, Lord. I plead the blood of Jesus over him. I know, Lord, those doctors, I pray you give them wisdom. And, Lord, they're, they're trying to figure out what to do to, to care for him, Lord. I pray, God, you touch his body. You're able, Lord, to, to reconnect all these nerves, God, that have been damaged. And you're able to awaken his left side. In the name of Jesus, I plead the blood of Jesus over him. I pray now, Lord, that there be a, a healing in his body. In Jesus' name, I believe you, Lord. You're able to reverse, Lord, the effect of this stroke in the name of Jesus. For by your stripes we are healed. We pray, Lord, you give Pat Fowler, Lord, a clean bill of health. As they go through this heart cat, Lord. Touch Phyllis, Lord. Touch Don Gates, Lord. We rebuke that cancer, that tumor that's in their body in the name of Jesus. I believe you, Lord. I'm trusting you, Lord. In Jesus' name, and I thank you for it, God. Touch those that are battling sickness tonight, those that can't be here tonight because they're sick, Lord. I pray your hand would be upon them. Give them the healing they need. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. And everybody said, in Jesus' name. Amen. I was back tonight before church. I go back and pray for our CR staff, Celebrate Recovery staff. And I was back there, one of our men that comes to church on Sunday, but he comes to CR every Wednesday night. His name's Mike. And uh, he left our church early after Sunday school this past Sunday because he was in terrible pain. He said, Brother Gene, I'm, I'm in terrible pain. So uh, in the process of between Sunday and, and tonight, he, he went to the doctor. They wanted to give him fentanyl for painkiller and, and, and some other things. And he, he knew his, you know, he understood the, the danger of that in his life. And so uh, the nurses said, well, well, doctor, he's refusing all this pain medication he doesn't want any of it. And uh, they said, well, what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to call uh, the people I go to church with, and I'm going to ask them to pray for me. He told me tonight, he said, Brother Gene, I called these good people, and they began to pray for me. He said, I'm telling you, all the pain went away. He said, I didn't need any pain medication. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Let's give God praise. Amen. Lord, we thank you. You're a healer. Amen. Lord, we praise you tonight. In Jesus' name. Somebody say praise the Lord. Amen. God bless you. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, I'm going to try to be real kind to you. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Thank you for being in church tonight. Thank you for being godly, loving people. Amen. Let's go and be kind. In Jesus' name.